Will infrastructure expenditure make the future brighter? The 2014 budget speech coverage is brought to you by Old Mutual Corporate. Welcome to the special coverage of the 2014 budget speech by Finance Minister Pravin Gordon. I'm Dumisho Greater. Well, joining me on the panel today to look at tax related and personal finance issues is Ben Skuman Haldanes, who's the Director of Corporate Tax and Head of Mining Tax at KPMG, and Andrew Wellstead, who's the Head of Tax at Norton Rose Fulbright. And in our Cape Town studios, we have Derek Ferreira, who's the Customer and Intermediary Solutions Manager at Old Mutual. Uh, please do remember that you can share your thoughts with us by calling us on 011-384-0598 or you can tweet us on at CNBC Africa hashtag SA Budget 2014. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time to join us today. I think uh, before, before we get into some of the real issues that came out, you can give me your thoughts on what came out of today. Maybe we can start with you, Ben Skuman. What were some of your, your thoughts? Was this what you expected? I th we were definitely pleasantly surprised. The Minister of Finance has uh, delivered a very solid budget um, given the economic conditions uh, around the globe and specifically in South Africa. Um, I believe he's, he's really done the right thing with his budget. I believe he's uh, sort of closing quote where he quotes President Mandela's opening remarks at his inauguration, let there be work, bread, water, salt for all, is sort of telling about this budget. Mm. And Andrew, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree absolutely with Ben. It was a very positive budget. Um, it was the right tone in these circumstances. To be honest with you, I'm glad to say when asked for our predictions, nobody had said that we expected any fireworks. It is in the context of an election year, and there is the Davis Review Committee that is taking a long studied look at the tax regime ge generally. But, you know, th unexpected things can happen, and I think it's a solid budget focusing on the right issues. So a good budget in our view. Mm. I'm just going to cross over to our Cape Town studios now to get uh, Derek into the conversation. Uh, Derek, what stood out for you? Because I think one of the things when you talk about tax, uh, that's definitely a certain thing that people want to know about. Uh, there was about, I think, 9.5 billion with regards to relief that households could see. What does that mean for the consumer? Is this a good or a bad thing? Um, good afternoon. I think from a consumer perspective, Certainly one can, and I echo um, the previous um, comments as well, a, a balanced um, budget reading as well. The 9.25 billion rand announced in tax relief um, is certainly um, not unexpected and probably aligned to inflationary increases um, for the man in the street, the personal um, income earner. Um, all that, of course, the bulk of where that will be for income, people earning incomes below 250,000. Nevertheless, there is um, tax relief from a marginal income tax rate perspective. Um, I think for a man in the street as well, one's got to view that um, in the context of indirect taxes increasing. And here I'm referring to those that we've become so used to, uh, your so-called sin taxes on tobacco, alcohol, etc. Um, added to that, there is pressure for the consumer as well, because mm. we've also had a further announcement in the fuel taxation of 12 cents per litre road accident fund of eight cents per litre. Mm. I think we've got to see that um, in the context of uh, recent um, hike in fuel prices. So, and of course we had also um, some two, three weeks ago an interest, interest rate increase. So certainly pressure on the consumer from a disposable income perspective, what we've seen. Mm. Um, at the same time, we've also had some announcements and confirmation of what was alluded to in previous and uh, readings of the annual budget around encouragement um, to save. And that was pleasing to see the um, detail around the tax-free savings vehicle account um, for those contributing up to 30,000 rand, a certain move afoot to encourage the consumer, the man in the street, to accumulate capital to a large extent. Mm -hmm. And then from an, another nice balancing act, I will call it, is for the pension funds where the tax-free concession has increased from 315,000 rand to 500,000. Almost one can say um, balancing where one wouldn't expect to have enjoyed tax relief 
on your contributions to retirement vehicles mm. uh, and that now of course one will enjoy a tax concession mm. at that time. Derek let me just interject there before I come back to the studios uh, here in Johannesburg uh, just to get your view on uh, some of the uh, so some of the commentary that was made around the medical aid or medical tax credits they're saying that the monthly credit scheme contributions with regards to tax credits will be increased I mean what does that mean again for the consumer? Again, um, not much detail on the implementation and final commitment on National Health Insurance Plan, but again, um, there is some tax concession, um, dispensation on the contribution on a monthly rate, where you've had an increase uh, for the first two members and any other beneficiaries on a medical scheme, that your tax credit um, will be increased. And we merely see that as an inflationary increase um, yet one can see that there's a lot of pressure on the cost of medical schemes. So we're looking forward to further announcements and development around National Health Insurance Plan to see what actual detail comes out of that. Mm. Now just back here in the Johannesburg uh, studios, maybe Andrew you can uh, touch on this uh, for us. You know we were expecting to hear a lot with regards to the tax committee. We understand there's been uh, two of these recommendations have been adopted. What's been your view to that because this is meant to enhance uh, business practices and uh, foster entrepreneurship? Yeah I think <coughs> you saw in, in the changes announced in relation to small and medium enterprises and small businesses they could well be based and in all likelihood they are based on the first report that's already been submitted by the Davis Review Committee. Um, the, the, that's the first report that's been submitted. The next one is going to deal with base erosion and certain avoidance measures and they've announced that that'll be submitted in June. So from a committee perspective you can see that structure working. Um, the incentives for small businesses, uh, again something very positive, something people have been saying there's too much um, administrative burden on small businesses trying to um, make head or tail of their compliance obligations and even the turnover taxes that have applied and the lower rates have been difficult to implement. So again, not great detail but there is a positive statement and there's a positive intent to try and make small businesses easier to run and easier to administer from a fiscal perspective. Ben Skuman, what do you make of uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, or changes that have been put in place in order to foster regional trade? I mean, when it comes to some of the incentives there, because there has been a big focus when it comes to you know, taxes around uh, regional trade and fostering that. Uh, South Africa being part of Africa and taking a leadership role is certainly uh, spearheading the um, initiatives around uh, uh, an African initiative for, for trade and investment and it's certainly to be welcomed. I mean we see developments around customs, um, one-stop shops as the minister put it for, for certain border posts being implemented etc. So it's, it's definitely encouraging. Um, it's also seeking to ensure that there's uh, compliance across the board uh, with regards to cross-border trade and activities. Um, and perhaps just to touch on, on the Davis Committee, they are going to specifically focus on indirect taxes. Mm. Um, as Andrew mentioned, the, the small, medium uh, business enterprise um, initiatives are to be welcomed because it ultimately, if successful, will broaden the tax base and, and that's very important going forward. Mm. They also mentioned with regards to uh, the, the Davis uh, Tax Committee that they would be looking at uh, things like the mining uh, taxes going forward. I mean, using some of your expertise, we know that you, you, you do have quite a lot of knowledge when it comes to that. Uh, did you get everything that you wanted to hear when it comes to that? Uh, the mining um, submissions uh, from a Davis committee point of view has only really opened in 2014 and we anticipate that there's going to be quite a, a significant amount of submissions being made through the mining sector, stakeholders, uh, the Chamber of Mines for instance. Um, leading from that, it is, there's bound to be certain in engagements between the committee and, and the stakeholders within the sector and uh, stemming from that one can only assume that mining in the context of South African economy will be looked at and then um, once you understand and evaluate that um, in the broader context of our economy and the contribution that mining makes, you then start looking at the more technical changes um, that affects mining companies going forward. And last year already there were announcements regarding state royalty. We've seen certain changes in the South African uh, tax amendments that's, uh, that's starting to apply from the 1st of March. Um, some of them are, are, are being looked at uh, very thoroughly. It, it could have some, uh, some uh, cost implications for mining companies. And going forward with the Davis Committee, we can only assume that 
uh, all of this will be taken on board to see where mining tax ends up in South Africa. Uh, Derek, I'd like to bring you into the conversation before we head over to a quick break. After looking at the budget speech, what, what would you say uh, stood out most for you and what was the most important uh, fact that consumers uh, should be taking away? The most important point to me at this point in time would certainly be for the consumer to realize there is pressure on disposable income. There is certainly sufficient measures and um, encouragement to provide for capital accumulation utilizing all the tax concessions as contained in the various forms of legislation and regulations. So my key takeout would be to optimize all the tax concessions, tax deductions, um, tax incentives to save, to accumulate capital so as to become less reliant on, on grants and social handouts um, and it's really preparing yourself for your own financial well-being. Welcome back as we continue our coverage of the Finance Minister Pravin Gordon's budget speech with a special focus on tax. Now joining me at the desk is Gerard Sovereau, a partner in tax and practice at Water at PricewaterhouseCoopers and I've got Rob Stretch who's the Director of General Tax and Capital Gains Tax at EY. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time to join us today. Pleasure. A lot has been said with regards to uh, tax. Um, how, was there anything that came out that surprised either of you. Maybe I can start with you, Gerard. Um, no, nothing that surprised me. I think um, one of the interesting points I, I noticed is on things like environmental taxes. Mm. We've kind of, in a sense, uh, as I say, kicked that can, can down the road for the time being because I think there's still a lot of stakeholders who are who need to be consulted around what kind of carbon taxation and environmental taxation we do bring in. I think the experience of the Australians most recently with the introduction of their mining environmental taxes has shown that uh, it's not always well received and it can have a negative impact potentially on the economy. Um, so that, not, whilst well, not a surprise, I think uh, uh, is, is probably a good thing that that's been uh, put back a bit until mm. 2016, I think the, the planned implementation date is. Robbie, your thoughts, anything that came up from here that was uh, you know, interesting for you and with regards to that environment tags being pushed out, um, what do you think, what, you know, what do you make of that? I, I think they're battling to come to grips with how to actually implement it. Uh, in terms of, of what are the measurements and so on and then which industries may in fact have certain exemptions and how do you measure those exemptions that they might actually have. So for example an ESKIM. Uh, yeah, in terms of, of surprises I think uh, the biggest surprise to me was that uh, how, um, <coughs> that nothing really changed. You know, he kept it very simple. I think a lot of commentators have said over the last couple of months uh, Know, expect maybe an increase in the inclusion rate for capital gains tax, mm. perhaps in, uh, an increase in, in personal tax rates at the top level, but he's kept it you know, down where it was and in fact given something back by way of your personal taxes. Mm. Rob, would you say that there is a fair balance between you know, a value added tax and, and, uh, you know, and personal tax and corporate tax? Do you think that we've got the balance right? I think the balance is, is getting there. I think personal tax is still relatively too high in relation to the others. Uh, um, and, it, and it seems to be concentrated in the hands of relatively few. So I would like to see perhaps uh, a broader based tax um, affecting everybody at, at, to a greater level. Do you think that he implemented this in the right way? Maybe I can pose the same question to you, Gerard. I think um, uh, indirect tax is... Uh, is a, is a difficult one in the sense that the, the general consensus around the, around the world is that it's the most effective means of taxation because it's the, let's say, most efficient means of collecting tax. Those of us who um, manage indirect taxes know that uh, we do all the work in terms of the returns and so on. Um, but there's an issue about whether it is a, what we call a progressive tax mm -hmm. in the sense that it, it, it taxes you no matter what your income levels are. And that's, that's probably the issue that they're battling with. I mean, you can look at things like increasing rates, but if you do that, the people that suffer tend to suffer most are the, the poorest people who don't actually have the um, income to, to, to maybe afford the tax increase. So that's the big issue around in, um, indirect taxes and the balance between indirect tax and direct taxes. You know, you've got to keep it to a point where the general population isn't hurting too much, um, but also obviously the, there's a need to raise revenue.
So would it be a, a good time to perhaps maybe raise taxes on the wealthy? There was a lot of speculation about that uh, before the budget speech sure. that we could have seen the wealthy people uh, you know, bearing the tax burden. Um, what's your take on that? Uh, I would actually say the wealthy, and that, that is a very, very subjective term, may I say, <laughs> uh, especially in South Africa and in emerging market. But I think the wealthy, so to speak, bear the, the greater tax burden in any event. So your question is, um, is it worth increasing that burden at the expense of stifling maybe entrepreneurialism, ep economic growth? Or is it rather a better idea, as Rob was saying earlier on, to broaden that tax base so that more of us pay something as opposed yeah. to burdening, let's say, the minority um, with additional taxes? Mm. Yeah, you touched on entrepreneurship. Uh, Rob, if I can just speak Please. to you with regards to that. Uh, there was a strong focus when it comes to SMEs and, and entrepreneurship. Uh, do you think that this budget does that? Does that foster that sort of entrepreneurial uh, spirit? I, I think they are doing a lot towards uh, that in terms of... of uh, basically simplifying the tax system as it applies to, to small to medium-sized enterprises and lowering, lowering their tax rates. Um, personally, I don't see many entities that fall within that particular environment uh, that, that are actually benefiting from those. And I think one of the biggest problems that we face is not on the tax side or the administration burden relating to it, but is the getting finance for those small businesses, you know, to fund their working capital and so on. And, and that, I think, is the bigger issue in terms of, of getting those businesses going rather than the ta these small tax breaks that they have. Yes, they help, but you have to be in that position to have started that small business. Mm. Um, uh, Rob, hold that thought because we're going to take yeah. a quick look at what the Finance uh, Minister Pravin Gordon had to say about the main tax proposals for the 2014 budget. Your taxes go up. No, no, no. Relax, relax. We don't want any heart attacks here. <laughs> Personal income tax relief amounts to 9.25 billion rand. So that's what we're giving back to taxpayers to give relief for inflation. About 40% of this relief goes to South Africans earning below 250,000 rands per year. There is no increased tax rate for all of you. <laughs> An increase in the tax-free lump sum amount paid out, for uh, out of retirement funds will increase from 315,000 to 500,000 rands, <laughs> benefiting especially lower income members who did not benefit from deductible contributions. Well, that was the Finance Minister, Pravin Gordon, and I think that's exactly what we've been uh, talking about with regards to uh, taxes and the breakdown of that. Maybe let's talk about some of the other issues that came out, because there was a lot of focus on the national health insurance and uh, what this means in terms of the NC's manifesto, saying that, you know, last year, uh, when they were talking about this, they were looking at the government possibly funding this for the next five years. Uh, what's your take on this? So I'll start with you, Rob, again. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of debate as to um, how it's actually going to be funded, who's actually going to bear the cost, and do they have the manpower to actually implement it? So I, I don't think it's something that's going to resolve in the short term. I would actually th see that it's probably three to five years away before there's any clarity as to the implementation and the implementation date of it. Gerard? Look, I would think... Um, uh, to me, the major issue is getting the balance right between all different types of taxes. If you look at the total tax burden for any South African, whether paying um, personal income tax or form of or like business tax, it, it is significant. And I think adding another tax at, at any time in the next two to three years of any significance uh, is going to potentially tip tip us into difficult econ economic times. At the end of the day, you need to have the money to pay the tax. Mm. So to me, the, the emphasis is, is, although we all agree that there needs to be some provision for national health, I don't disagree with that as a principle, but the emphasis to me needs to be on, on growing the economy, which means, I think, releasing small business from a lot of the red tape and cash flow burdens, as Rob mentioned earlier on, and, and allowing those, those, econ those entrepreneurs to flourish. I think that, to me, is, is, a, is a critical uh, thing that uh, the government has to, has to foster. Mm. We've seen corporate tax, uh, you know, uh, it, um, edging down slightly. I mean, we're sitting at now, I think, a 20 or 29 percent. Right, yes. um, you know, do you think this is a high enough level in order for us to collect the revenue that we need? Uh, look, I, I probably would say this, but as a, as a person in business, I think it's, it's high enough. Um, I think, much like Rob, we need to spread the, the, the tax base and get as many people into that, into that net as possible in various forms. 
indirect taxes is, is one way, um, and obviously through some of the um, job subsidies and so on which government is introducing, we should grow the pie in terms of um, personal income tax payers. I prefer that way rather than um, increasing tax amounts, because I think there's a bit of a supply and demand relationship there. You know, the more you tax people in some ways, the possibly the less you get out of them from, from a productivity perspective. Uh, and I, I think it could be counterproductive if we, if we go too far with taxation. That would be my, my personal view. Mm. And Rob, let's just talk about some of the stimulants and incentives that government uh, is using currently. Uh, one of the things that the minister came up with was the youth employment tax incentive. Mm. Yeah, that, that was introduced, I think, from 1st of January this year. And uh, I, th I think he made the comment that there are 50,000 people on it. Um, so yes, it's, 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 a, it's a good step in the right direction. But I think the majority of businesses, if, if you take it, they're not simply going to employ because they're getting a tax break. They want to get some return on it. And they've got shareholders sitting there that you know, want the return. So yes, it's a step in the right direction, but I think it's, it's only one of many steps that needs to be taken in order to, to increase the, the employment. Mm. With regards to step in the right direction, I mean, I think earlier on we were talking about those uh, green taxes and talking mm. about uh, mining uh, taxes specifically. Um, there was one thing that they came out with, and I think they were just looking in terms of um, the amount of, of taxes that they will be charging. And I'll have that for you in a moment. This is with regards to the acid mine drainage that they're yes. looking to mm. be taxed. I mean, uh, maybe let's touch on that because is this maybe not a way of incentivizing uh, companies to be more environmentally conscious so you could basically just do away with other taxes or, or not <laughs> mm. yeah. just do away with taxes if you can find well, a government taxes, well, that yeah, is. Yeah, green taxes. If you can find a government that would do that then uh, that'd be an interesting interesting place to live I think um, the acid mine drainage issue uh, as we all know is, is, a, is a major problem for us it's a major pollution issue and health issue um, I guess a couple of ways of tackling it either to Perform, give some kind of tax credit to those businesses that invest in managing and rehabilitating those, those mines, or a, a form of tax um, as a, almost like a punishment, if you like, um, uh, um, in terms of if you don't do something to manage this, this particular issue, then, then your tax burden will go up. Or indeed just levering a tax much like a carbon tax or some description according to the degree to which you, you, you let's say, you pollute. There are various ways of tackling it, and I think at the moment the government is still hasn't made up its mind as to which is the most sensible way of dealing with this particular problem. I know there is money put aside, several billion rand put aside to tackle the problem, but I think most commentators will agree it's not enough, and I think government probably understands that, but it is a start at least. The big issue is we, we, doesn't, we don't need it to get any worse, and therefore I think some means of, of incentivizing businesses, um, or indeed maybe penalizing if they don't do the right thing, uh, is definitely on the cards. Mm. Robbie, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think part of the, the acid mine uh, issue, uh, drainage issues is goes back historically. Mm -hmm. I think you know, going forward, I think most mines are taking steps to at least try and limit it. But I think there, there's a, a past that needs to be dealt with. And I'm not entirely sure how one actually deals with it. It's, it's, one can uh, say there's going to be a tax, but how do you impose that tax? How do you measure it? You know, it's one thing to have an income tax where you say, well, that's what your income is and that's what your tax is at a percentage. How do you measure the amount of tax that you're going to pay for, for asset mine drainage? Mm. Would and you say so that's a difficulty I think that you, we face. Would you say, you know, given everything that you've seen in the budgets today, and I'm sure we're going to be touching yeah. on that a bit later, that this was an investor-friendly budget, especially when it comes to attracting foreign direct investments and the incentives that are on the table? Yeah, I, I think there are incentives, um, and, and you know some of the incentives are good. Um, what we have to be a little bit careful of is that in each budget speech, they do announce certain incentives, but the implementation implementation date of those incentives is sometimes delayed. So you, you find that there might have been incentives that were announced last year that haven't yet been implemented. Yeah. You know, so now there, there's new incentives they're proposing. Um, what is the date of implementation? So, for example, you've got these special economic zones. Uh, there was some draft legislation or legislation that was brought in last year, uh, or it's in the Income Tax Act dealing with them, but there's no implementation date as yet. Mm. So, it, it's a question of, of trying to tie in what is the implementation date and what is the effect going to be from that time on. 
Um, Gerard, you know, you just heard Rob talking mm. about those uh, the special economic uh, zones. Have they been able to bear fruit? Have we seen, uh, you know, the, the types of revenues coming uh, from those uh, specific, um, you know, legislation or those specific, um, no, I, I forget understand. the word, lost the words now. No, sure, I understand. Look, I think, as Robert said, that uh, implementation hasn't um, fully taken place yet. And so it's just early days. Um, my, my take on, you know, your earlier question to Rob in terms of, the general sense of the budget encouraging um, inward investment. It strikes me as more of a budget for South Africa and encouraging South Africans to, to get into business and to, to kind of you know, don their entrepreneurial shirts, if you like, and, and get on with growing the economy. There's still a lot more to do because, as Rob quite rightly says, these are proposals. And as I'm sure many competitors will tell you, the devil is in the detail. So we'll see how that comes, comes out. But I think the, certainly the, the approach uh, and the sentiment seems to me uh, the, the, right, the right way. Mm. Uh, the gentlemen, we'll, we'll be continuing uh, this uh, focus uh, with your other uh, colleagues that we had uh, earlier on in the show. We'll be taking a short break now, but when we return, we still continue our discussion with tax. And uh, joining us on the decks, we will have Andrew and Ben Skuman. So don't go away. Welcome back. Let's take a look, quick look now at what the financial minister had to say about the Davis Committee on the burden of small businesses. The turnover tax regime will be amended to further reduce the tax burden on micro enterprises, and consideration is being given to replacing the graduated tax structure for small business corporations with a refundable tax compliance credit. Okay, Ben Skuman, I'm going to uh, start with you. What do you make of uh, what the finance minister had to say uh, with regards to that? I know we have been uh, touching on it uh, sporadically, but what's your, what's your take on that? It's, it's very clearly aimed at ensuring that we broaden the tax base in South Africa and making the cost of complying with our tax legislation um, lower. Certainly, the Income Tax Act as it stands today is, is a fairly complicated set of legislation, and for small businesses, micro-businesses, it's most certainly uh, something that they won't get their minds around in general. And hence, this initiative is definitely to be welcomed. If, if it's successful, we broaden the tax base, it's good for South Africa, it's good for everybody living in this country. Mm. And maybe let me spell a chat to you, Andrew, with regards to the simplicity of the current of our current uh, tax structure. Um, you know, what else do you think could possibly be done? And did the minister do enough with regards to simplifying our current uh, tax structure? Well, I think the simplification of the current te tax structure is going to be something that the Davis Committee will be looking at. Again, we keep jumping to them, but really that's their job. They're looking at the tax regime in South Africa. The one positive step that he did by not doing was we've had a lot of legislation announced in the budget, and we've had a lot of legislation coming through in previous years. Lots of complex changes, um, lots of changes aimed at anti-avoidance in particular, which are lengthy and difficult to... Um, to navigate your way through. And this year, there's certainly some technical amendments, there's going to be some changes, but there's not the sheer volume that we've been anticipating. Again, I think you can put it down to the Davis Committee, but it's certainly a welcome breather for the tax paying community and the tax practitioner community, because the tax changes that they have mentioned are actually focusing on certain technical issues, which would probably bore, bore the listenership or the viewership, but they're technical issues that we need to really get to grips with. So. I was actually very encouraged by what they did announce from a tax change perspective and what they didn't announce as well. Mm. Uh, Gerard, let's get your thoughts on what came out of the budget that you, what didn't come out of the budget that you would have liked to have seen more. Uh, earlier on, we had Godwin Mutizo who had a panel with him, and what he said was that you know, he thinks this budget should have been uh, post elections. Uh, you know, does the supply in the tax perspective, uh, was the, were they unaffected? But I think um, um, expecting a, a radical budget just before an election is um, potentially asking a bit much, if I'm honest with you. I think at the end of the day, uh, it's still a political grouping, the ANC, and they need to, to gauge the changes they make in context of, of the political landscape. Um, in terms of um, what I would have liked to have seen, um, I actually agree um, in the sense that uh, the, the Davis c uh, Committee, its job is to look at the entire tax landscape of South Africa, um, also take into consideration international um, norms, not even best practice necessarily, but norms at least, and come up with a view which helps us with a more balanced approach to managing tax. And that's everything from rates to incidence of tax 
um, to administrative burden. Um, and I think it would have been probably the wrong thing to do to preempt uh, um, the outcome of, of that committee's work. Um, so I think the best thing, absolutely, you tinker with what you can that doesn't have a major impact. And some of these subsidies and so on, which they're looking to in introduce, I don't think will have a major impact necessarily on the overall tax position of the country, but you allow that committee to do its work. And it's going to be interesting, I think, very interesting what they come up with, because everything seems to be on the table. There doesn't seem to be any kind of sacred cows uh, and any particular area of tax which, you know, is, is not to be touched. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a terrific, uh, um, very wide ambit, and so hopefully there'll be some interesting stuff coming out of that. Mm. Rob, I have a, a tall ask for you because uh, we've been speaking quite a bit about the Davis right. Committee. Mm. Uh, they have put forward that they're going to be looking at minus mining taxes. There are a few mm. other things that they'll be looking at in terms of incentives. Going forward into the next budget speech, asking you to look into your crystal ball here, mm. what, do you th what, what, what sort of speculations or what sort of expectations uh, do you have uh, coming out from, from those uh, specific sectors? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, I, I think we've got to wait for, for the Davis Commission to, to actually come out with what its report is going to be. And then I think they'll probably look at implementing that. Um, overall, I would think that there's got to be a balance between the various taxes, between your direct personal taxes on individuals and co corporates, and your, your VAT collections, and also your other indirect taxes. And one's also got to be realistic that the taxes that are introduced or, or, or the balance of the taxes needs to be an investor-friendly uh, environment. You know, investors are now looking at various places around the world and they're saying, well, you know, where's best for us? Uh, and where is South Africa going back, you know, maybe five years ago was probably an attractive place within Africa to set up your, your base of, for expansion into Africa. Perhaps it's not the most attractive place now, bearing in mind um, different incentives in other countries like the Nigerias and Kenyas, etc. Mm. So do we, we've, we've lost a little bit of ground on that basis. Mm. Um, Andrew, maybe I'm going to be putting you on the spot, but after what Rob said, we need to strike the right balance. What would be the right balance? I mean, percentage-wise, if you were able to look at maybe your corporate taxes or your, your VATs, there have been a lot of talk that the VATs have been uh, too low since 1993. What's the right balance in your view? Well, I, <coughs> I heard it said earlier that obviously broad-based taxes and transactional taxes are attractive because they bring everyone within the fold but we need to be a little bit sensitive to the political history of the country as well. You know, I, I, I'm of the view that um, the, the current tax regime, the, the income tax regime with a staggered approach to taxing, uh, so you tax higher income at higher rates, tends to make sense. I think that we've kept the VAT rate low, um, re relatively speaking, for quite some time, and there's been a lot of pressure to increase, but as I say, again, for political reasons. So I, I think the interesting thing is not so much what do we do with tax rates and indirect versus direct? It's how do we manage the system? Do we, do we introduce a whole swathe of new taxes that was touched on earlier in the discussion? Because that's really my fear. We try and bamboozle taxpayers by saying, well, you know, you'll pay an e-toll or you'll pay a couple of cents towards the NHI and it's not a tax. Mm. It, it's managing those things and also being real, realistic about what spending the government can undertake. So just as you balance your budget at home, you've got to start with, okay, what do I have? And that's really the key. If we, if we get into the game of saying, well, let's have more, let's increase that, let's have an NHI tax, that's where I think th things are going to go wrong. And I'm hopeful of the fact that the Davis Committee will bear that in mind, that there's only so much that you can ask um, taxpayers to produce. Gentlemen, well, thank you so much uh, for your time and being here with us to, uh, today. Well, that's it for the special focus on tax. Uh, thank you to our guests, Ben Skuman Khaldanes, for the Director of Corporate Tax and Head of Mining Tax at KPMG, and Andrew, Andrew Wellstead, who's the Head of Tax at Norton Rose Fulbright, uh, Gerard Sovereil, who's a partner in tax at Price Waterhouse Coopers, and uh, Rob Stretch, who's the Director of General Tax and Capital Gains Tax at EY. Will infrastructure expenditure make the future brighter? The 2014 budget speech coverage is brought to you by Old Mutual Corporate.